All right, hello everyone. It is just a little bit past seven in the evening, so we want to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the second in our online series of the Maastricht Migration Lecture Series. My name is Melissa Siegel and I'm a professor of migration studies and I will be um, your chair for this evening. Now, the purpose of the Maastricht Migration Lecture Series is really to bring information about migration and about migration research to the general public. So these are talks that are meant for a non-specifically academic audience, and the idea is to also have a wide reach. And because we're now able to do these online, obviously because of COVID, it also enables us to have an even greater reach. So it's Fantastic to see so many of you here this evening. Now, this lecture series is um, a combined effort um, or is jointly hosted by um, the Refugee Project Maastricht, Maastricht University, the Maastricht Center for Citizenship, Migration and Development, the Maastricht Young Academy, the United Nations Student Association, and UNU Merit. So uh, we're very happy to have everyone here today and to have such a large group of people hosting this event. Now, this is the second in our series, and we're very, I'm very happy today to have um, a quite distinguished person with us, uh, Professor Martin Fink. Uh, professor Martin Fink is a professor of political sociology at the Department of Political Science at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. However, since the 1st of September, he is on special leave from Maastricht University because he is now currently holding the chair in, in citizenship studies at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies at the European Uni University Institute in Florence. And that is where he is joining us from today. So another one of the perks of having online events is that of course you can have people um, joining from anywhere in the world. Um, so Professor Fink leads the research project, Migrant Life Course and Legal Status Transitions which is actually funded by a consolidator grant of the European Research Council. And so this is actually a very prestigious grant um, that has followed up much of the research that he has done previously also on citizenship. So I would say he's one of the citizenship gurus and one of the people who is best known um, in citizenship studies, especially in, in Europe, I would say. He is also one of the founders um, and previously a co-director for the Maastricht Center for Citizenship, Citizenship Migration and Development, having a hard time with that word today. Um, so we're, it's really a pleasure, Martin, to have you um, already back helping us out and contributing to an event um, that is sponsored by, by Maastricht University and Maximite. So it's great to have you here, um, just so everyone knows the rules of, the, of our um, operation today. The talk will be around 40 minutes, and then we will have plenty of time for questions. Um, at any time during the talk, please feel free to already write questions in the YouTube chat. And I will be monitoring those, and then I will make sure to feed your questions to Professor Fink also when the talk is over. But you're, feel free to write them in that chat uh, or in the Q&A section um, at any time. So without further ado, um, Martin, I turn the floor over to you. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Melissa. Uh, can you hear me well? Just to check. Uh, well, good night, everyone. Um, greetings from uh, Florence. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Many thanks, Melissa um, and uh, Maastricht University um, for the um, invitation. Um, I'm really sorry that I cannot see uh, anyone in the audience, so I'm, um, I'm, uh, I'm glad that I can see uh, Melissa on the screen, so, I'm, uh, uh, so at least I can see someone listen, listening to me, um, and I, am, I imagine that there will be um, well, uh, at least some of you listening in, and uh, otherwise that you can see the, uh, the video of the lecture um, afterwards on uh, YouTube. Um, I'm also sorry that I cannot be there in Maastricht with my colleagues in uh, my former colleagues in Maastricht. Um, due to uh, the pandemic, of course, everything is a bit uh, different. But I'm delighted that I can indeed um, zoom in uh, tonight to talk about my uh, favorite uh, topic in research, which is citizenship. Um, 
I would like to talk about the question that you see in front of you on the screen. Um, does citizenship matter? Now, many of you might think that's a bit of a strange question. Um, first of all, what actually is citizenship? And um, some of you might say, well, obviously it matters. And others might say, well, actually, um, yeah, I have a passport, but um, it doesn't really mean that much to me. So to me, um, it's not something that I find important. What is more important is my um, associations with my football club, or I feel more of a Maastrichtian, or I associate with the neighborhood or with my, uh, or the church where I'm going and citizenship, the legal status of a person in a state. Um, that's not something that is uh, particularly um, important to me. Now, what I would like to talk today about the question of uh, whether citizenship matters, I'm going to talk about that, especially from a migration perspective. So that's important. Um, I think if you are not a migrant, there are still many reasons for why citizenship may be important. Um, but you could argue that it becomes a bit less important because one of the main elements of citizenship is also um, particularly related to migration and mobility, namely, um, yeah, it, it might provide you with mobility rights. And that's also why um, many of you who have a migration uh, experience and who are listening might say, well, of course, citizenship matters uh, to me. And actually, it is not so much the question whether citizenship matters, but what really matters is which citizenship matters. So I happen to be born in country X, um, but if I would be, if I would have been born in country Y, my mobility rights um, throughout the world would have been much larger. And so actually I feel that I'm very lucky by having been born in the wrong country. And there may also be people among you who are listening in and actually do not have a citizenship. So that's what we describe in the literature and also legally as uh, statelessness, right? So statelessness, literally speaking, might mean, well, you are not part of a state. Um, but when we talk about citizenship, you could say this, this refers actually to citizenship less, right? So we, we, are, we are not recognized by a state of being um, a citizen of that state. And for people without any citizenship, the answer to this question probably would also be very obvious, namely, of course it matters. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is the research project that I'm doing together with uh, colleagues at uh, Maastricht University, uh, funded by the European Research Council, and uh, Melissa already referred to that. So that's the My Life Status uh, project, Migrant Life Course and Legal Status Transitions. And when I talk about legal status transition, I'm talking especially about the transition um, from not being a citizen to being a citizen of a country. And that's what we uh, sometimes call um, naturalization. So another difficult word to become more natural. Um, so you could write a whole book about uh, the, uh, the history of that uh, term naturalization. And I'm not going to talk too much about this. We, we use this um, legally speaking and also more colloquially as um, the process of acquiring the citizenship of a state. And so my perspective on citizenship and migration today will be especially from an immigration perspective, right? And so that's important to keep in mind. I could give another lecture, and I'm happy to do that uh, at another time, about an emigration perspective of citizenship, right? So the perspective um, on citizenship by people who have left their country. And again, uh, many of you might be among that. I am myself. Um, well, I'm currently in, it, in Italy, as Melissa said, so, so I'm, I'm an immigrant of um, the Netherlands, right? But I'm still a Dutch uh, citizen. And that's actually the only citizen I have. So I have just one citizenship, but it's also a very valuable citizenship in terms of uh, mobility rights globally. So I can travel in the pre or hopefully post pandemic world. I, I can travel relatively uh, freely, visa free. Um, and so it's, uh, and it also gives me uh, rights in the Netherlands, which is a highly developed country. So just by being born in the Netherlands to two parents who were Dutch, actually, I am extremely lucky. Right? Um, but others among you who might, um, who might be a migrant and maybe you are currently living in Maastricht, um, 
and maybe uh, you're interested in acquiring uh, the citizenship of the Netherlands. And if you were to acquire uh, the citizenship of the Netherlands, so Dutch citizenship, that's what we mean when we talk about uh, naturalization. So the act of becoming uh, a citizen. And we use that particular term naturalization because it is a particular way of acquiring citizenship. So um, it can be distinguished uh, for example, from getting citizenship at birth, right? So that's what we mean. That's where we use often the term birthright citizenship. Um, and you can be a, a citizen by birth, for example, because your, uh, your parents are, the, are a citizen of a country, or um, if you are from uh, the country where Melissa is from, so if you're from the United States and you are born there, uh, you are automatically a US citizen, right? So you don't need to have a, an American parent as long as you are born on American territory. Of course, if you have an American parent and you are not born on American territory, right? If you're born outside of the US, you might still get, um, uh, you might still acquire US citizenship under certain uh, conditions. Right, let's say I could give a whole talk about immigrant perspective, right? So in uh, a couple of days, there will be the uh, elections in the United States and many people will be voting from abroad or probably um, those people have already voted, right? So they have posted their vote. And so from that perspective, from an immigration perspective, citizenship is also um, very important. But I'm talking today, especially about an immigrant perspective on citizenship. And so what I would like to discuss with you is the question. So the public policy dilemmas that we face in the question um, under which conditions should states make uh, citizenship available to immigrants. And once an immigrant acquires the citizenship of that state, once somebody naturalizes in that country, what does that actually matter for their uh, life experience in the destination country? Right? So I'm, I'm taking today an immigration perspective, a perspective from a destination country. If you have questions about how this relates to origin country uh, dynamics and also the relevance of dual citizenship, we can talk a bit about that in the uh, Q&A. But there are a couple of things that I, I want to talk to you about, um, why actually citizenship matters. And then I would like to uh, take you um, through the, um, yeah, the questions that we deal with in the literature in investigating this question about to what extent does citizenship actually matter for the life course of an immigrant and how is that related to the public policy dilemmas that we face? And that relates to the uh, two different perspectives that you see here on the point two, the catalyst versus crown perspective. So some politicians, they see uh, citizenship as the crown on the integration perspective um, uh, trajectory. So it is something that only if you're extremely well integrated, you can speak fluent Dutch, you have lived there for a long time, then you can be a citizen. Whereas other politicians say, well, actually you can never be fully integrated if you don't have the legal means to do so. So you, uh, we should make citizenship uh, accessible to immigrants under reasonable, uh, relatively facilitated conditions so that it can give, the, give them a push in their integration trajectory. It will encourage people to become part of uh, the society where they reside. In other words, citizenship can be a catalyst of the integration uh, trajectory. Well, this is, an, uh, so it's a, uh, from a political perspective, it's a very important question and it comes back all the time when politicians uh, discuss that in uh, The Hague, for example, um, in the Netherlands. Um, um, but they are strong ideological, um, uh, there's strong ideological controversy about it, but it's not exactly um, easy to investigate from an academic perspective. So that's what I want to talk about under approaches. How can we actually investigate this? And what I will talk about particularly there is the chicken and egg problem. Um, and I will explain that under, under approaches, but we will definitely encounter a chicken and an egg problem. Uh, which is uh, complicated, but I'll also show you at least two different ways in which we can deal with this, um, in which uh, two different ways in which people have dealt with that in the literature. Well, then I'll share some findings. So what do we actually find when we apply these different um, approaches? Um, and at the end, um, Melissa asked me to uh, contextualize this also a bit in the context of the current situation in which we find ourselves. So citizenship in times of the pandemic and I'll have some, a couple of backup slides in case um, any questions come up related to that. Okay. 
Well, let's talk first about um, the privileges that are typically associated with citizenship, right? So again, what is citizenship? It's a legal status that indicates an, uh, a relation um, between an individual and a state. And that relationship comes with certain rights or privileges. And it might also come with certain obligations, of course. Right? Actually, in the literature, we mostly talk about rights. That's why people are often interested to acquire the citizenship of a country. But it might also come with obligations, right? So if you are a US citizen residing outside of the United States, you not only have the right to vote in the uh, presidential elections, but you actually also have the obligation to file to make a to file a tax declaration, right? And in that perspective, the United States is is one of the unique countries that also taxes its citizens uh, abroad, right? So that might be a, an obligation, or you might think of a jury duty, for example. Right, so it's actually not only about rights, but there are also obligations. But since I'm interested in the motivation of immigrants for acquiring citizenship, I'm mostly talking about uh, rights here. T typically, there are at least um, well three kinds of uh, rights that you might associate with citizenship, um, and the first one is the most um, classical one, and that goes back to already uh, Aristotle. Uh, who wrote in ancient uh, Greek times already about the relevance of citizenship and he understood citizenship, uh, a citizen as somebody who, who um, can rule and is ruled in turn, right? And that it means um, that citizenship is something related to not just being subject to rules, but also participating in the determination of rules, right? And nowadays in our mass democracies, this is of course expressed by the right to vote but also the right to uh, be a candidate in election, to stand for elections and to be elected into public office so that you can co-determine um, yeah, the rules um, of the game, right? So if we, if we think about the current situation, the pandemic, um, the politicians in The Hague, of course, they have to make very difficult decisions about um, whether, or in, in, in many, in almost all the capitals around the world, they have to make different decisions. How do we deal with this uh, pandemic? We have to balance between um, concerns, uh, public health concerns, and uh, perhaps the economy, right? And there's no clear cut answer. Some politicians might think, well, we should have a lockdown much earlier, and others say, well, we, we should keep things open as long as uh, possible. Um, and so politicians have to weigh the different uh, interests, and citizenship expresses the possibility that you, as a citizen, can also be elected into that decision making office. Right? And if you think, well, I'm not really the kind of person who should stand for a public office, who should be elected, at least I can cast my vote, right? And that's what many people, of course, in the current US elections um, have done, are doing, and uh, will do still until the 3rd of um, November. Right? So political rights indicates a degree of self, that citizenship is about self-government, right? It, it means that you are an essential part of the political community. Well, secondly, Apart from the political element, there are also socioeconomic rights. So for example, you might be elected into a public sector job, right? For example, um, being a policeman, in many countries you have to be a citizen. Um, access to healthcare may be associated with residents in the country, but it may sometimes also be um, come with certain rights um, uh, in which uh, citizens are privileged. And you can also think of education, right? So if you want to study in the Netherlands, for example, as a Dutch citizen or as an EU citizen, you have a lower tuition fee than if you are a citizen of a third country, right? So citizenship in that perspective also gives you more accessible um, education. Right? In the United States, uh, sometimes there are uh, differentiated um, fees for colleges or maybe, um, 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 yeah, so more facilitated conditions for, uh, uh, students who live in the state of the university in which they want to study, right? So in federal uh, states such as the United States or Switzerland, certain citizenship rights may also be associated with lower level um, um, government so states in, in federal um, states. And thirdly, um, citizenship is not only related to how we deal with rights and obligations within a community, but it's also related to how we deal with people who move between communities, right? And that's why uh, citizenship can be seen as a mobility instrument. Um, 
and, and this can be uh, this can express the relative degree of the relative value of citizenship. Right? If you're interested, there is also a, um, a so-called value of citizenship index that tries to exp um, yeah, express the relative value of um, a passport of, be of being a citizen of a country in a certain numerical score. Right? And an important element in that calculation is how many countries can I travel to without having to uh, request a visa in advance. Right? And if you are from Germany or the Netherlands or Denmark or Sweden, those are all countries that give extremely facilitated um, travel possibilities around the world. Uh, but if you're from a country such as um, Somalia, for example, you will have very limited traveling around the world. And for each country, you will have to, for many countries, you have to request a visa. And sometimes even um, if you want to travel through countries, you need to have a, a special visa for that. This is also why um, citizenship nowadays in the literature, there is a lot of talk about strategic citizenship, right? That um, my people who live, for example, in Latin America, so uh, Yossi Harpas has written about this, um, are interested in acquiring the citizenship of a country to which they might have facilitated access, for example, through descent. So people living in Latin America who have some Italian uh, descent, for example, um, might acquire Italian citizenship because one of their ancestors uh, 100 years ago traveled to um, Argentina, for example, even though they don't want necessarily to live in Italy themselves, but by acquiring, by making use of that right, by acquiring Italian citizenship um, through the ancestry of their parents, um, this increases their global um, mobility rights. And from that perspective, we often talk about uh, strategic citizenship. Now, if you're still not uh, convinced that um, citizenship really matters, let's uh, maybe talk a bit about um, much more privileged uh, citizens that have now become slightly less privileged, right? at least from a uh, mobility perspective, namely the citizens of the United Kingdom. And so when we talk about uh, Brexit, of course, uh, the status of the um, citizens of the United Kingdom uh, changed. Right? Previously, there were EU citizens, like the, so all uh, citizens of one of the member states of the European Union, there are also citizens of the European Union. So you are an EU citizen by virtue of being a citizen of one of the member states, right? the Netherlands, for example, or Germany or Belgium. Um, and so after Brexit, of course, the idea was that the UK got out of the European Union and that also affected the rights of, um, of um, UK citizens. And you can see here in the so-called naturalization statistics. So here you see the statistics from the Dutch, uh, from Statistics Netherlands, which you can find online. If you're interested in this, just go to Statline and, and, um, and search for that. Um, you see that until 2015, actually very few uh, British citizens living in the Netherlands were interested in becoming a Dutch citizen. And the reason for that is probably that um, they were apparently not so interested in political rights, but these might not be the most important uh, elements of uh, citizenship because if they, want, if they wanted to vote, they would have become citizens already earlier. Um, but um, since 2016, you see that the number of UK citizens residing in the Netherlands and who, who acquire the citizenship of the Netherlands has increased exponentially. So from uh, about 200 per year up to 2015 to um, two and a half thousand in 2019, right? And so this indicates that even for very privileged, um, globally speaking, uh, people such as UK citizens still a Dutch citizenship and therefore EU citizenship has, a, has an added value. Now, if you're interested in this, you can also look at this more comparatively. So you can look at the work by Auer and Tetlow, for example, uh, recently uh, published a working paper. Uh, you can see the references, the reference here on your screen, um, where they investigate the changing naturalization rates of the Brits in the European Union before and after Brexit. So Brexit is indicated in both of these graphs with a um, vertical red line, um, whereas the uh, uh, UK nationals residing in um, the European Union is indicated with the blue line and the uh, non-UK uh, European citizens is indicated by the dotted black line. And if you look at the left of your graph, you see that um, before 20, um, 
2015, you see that actually non-UK EU citizens were much more likely to acquire the citizenship of another member state. Right? So these might be uh, Italians or Portuguese residing in the UK, for example. People in the literature have argued that also the relative uh, difference in development levels still plays a role also uh, in the European Union, so between Southern and uh, Northwestern Europe or between uh, Central and Eastern Europe and, and Western Europe. And that's why the dotted black line is higher than the blue line. So before Brexit, UK nationals were not so interested to naturalize. Apparently the political rights, again, were not the most important ones, but the mobility rights, of course, were important. And by being an EU citizen, they had all these mobility rights. After Brexit, they lose the mobility rights. And that's why you see um, right on the right of the red uh, line that suddenly the blue line goes up exponentially. So this indicates that citizenship clearly matters. I would argue especially the mobility rights um, and the legal certainty that it gives as a resident in a country, um, even among um, a relatively privileged citizens such as UK citizens. Okay, let me keep an eye on the time because I see that I still have plenty to say and Melissa will uh, stop me if I, if I uh, talk too long. Right, so let's talk about this catalyst or crown paradigm. Right? So when we look at this from an immigration perspective, politicians have to make decisions about the conditions under which we make citizenship available. After how many years can you become a citizen? Do you need to do a language test, an integration test? Should you give up your other citizenship? And politicians have different views on this. Broadly speaking, uh, politicians on the ideological right, uh, they, they take the crown perspective. So you see here two quotes. From the, uh, from the CDA and the VVD in the Netherlands, where they say Dutch citizenship is the crown on participation and integration in society. It shouldn't be made available too easily. You have to work really hard for it and only at the end of the trajectory can you get uh, Dutch citizenship. Whereas people from the left-hand side of the ideological spectrum, they say, no, we should look at this differently. Naturalization is actually a catalyst for integration. So it is a positive welcome. It will help people to become and uh, part of our society. Okay, so these are political debates, but now how do we investigate that empirically? So how do we, how can we investigate this as uh, scholars? Well, actually, so then we have to look at the theoretical uh, mechanisms. And so when we look at the catalyst perspective, um, we see that actually there are four arguments typically used in the literature for why citizenship might be a catalyst for better um, for becoming part of society. We might call this better integration, but this can be expressed in labor market participation. So being more likely to be employed, having higher earnings or feeling more, uh, identifying more with the country where you reside or being more likely to stay in that country rather than to um, uh, onward uh, migrate. Um, and first of all, citizenship, as I explained to you earlier, might provide better access to jobs, right? That's why we might expect that it helps you in the labor market. So there are certain jobs only available to citizens. Political engagement, you all have certain rights. So therefore, maybe you're also more engaged, right? If you know that you can vote, you become more interested to, to read about the political developments. If you can't vote anyway, who cares? Right, it's not exactly, it's not necessarily like this, but this would be, this might be an argument. Um, citizenship might also provide a positive signal. And this is extremely important because we know from the literature, you see here the reference to the work by Zürnt and uh, Rudin on ethnic di discrimination, that actually there is a lot of discrimination in the labor market of immigrants. Right? So when hiring, employers have to make a decision and they often favor, uh, they might favor uh, natives over immigrants. And in the citizenship literature, um, right, so this is well documented, but in the citizenship li literature, um, scholars argue that, well, in the context of statistical discrimination, right, where employers like to reduce um, uncertainty as much as possible relating to the uh, hiring decision, that they might feel more comfortable to offer the uh, job to a naturalized immigrant rather than to a non-naturalized immigrant. Right? Because they know that, well, first of all, they don't have to worry about the work visa because a naturalized immigrant will have a, um, uh, the most secure resident status, obviously will have the right to work. So they don't have to, to worry about the paperwork. 
um, and they might also have a better expectation that this person is more likely to stay um, in the country and therefore to make a long-term investment in that person by offering the job. Um, also, actually, um, but there may also be a citizenship more from a um, individual perspective. And this is where we have to make use of the human capital theory from the economics literature. So you, you see the work by Becker, for example, here, right? So if a migrant, uh, right? So in order to get a job, you need certain capital, right? And especially education is very important. Also um, um, speaking the language, for example. So you have to invest in learning the language of a new country. Right? I'm trying to learn Italian here. On the um, here in Italy, and it's not so easy to learn a new language, right? So you have to make an effort for that. Um, now, if a migrant has a clear prospect that he or she can become a citizen, and especially if that person can become a citizen relatively early in the uh, trajectory, the migration trajectory, he or she might be more willing to invest in uh, learning the language of the country, so to acquiring the human capital that he or she can use. Um, for finding a way in the, the new society, in the labor market. May also feel more uh, at ease to demand uh, work rights or negotiate uh, wages, right? So, so there are clear arguments in favor of why we would expect that there is a, uh, an, um, a causal effect on uh, certain measurable outcomes, for example, in the labor market, right? And that would be the, um, the catalyst perspective but there are also reasons to be a bit skeptical about this, right? So reasons in favor of the crown perspective. Um, and uh, people might say, well, citizenship, once you have a, a green card in the United States, once you have permanent residence, you have already a very um, a secure status and citizenship will have relatively little uh, added value. With regard to um, finding your way in society, becoming, feel, developing a, a sense of uh, belonging and also uh, participating uh, politically. Um, for example, not just by voting, that's of course limited to citizens, but also by participating in manifestations or signing petitions. Uh, people argue that um, these habits are actually quite sticky, as we might say. So they are determined early on in somebody's um, uh, life, especially when you are young and adolescent. And um, if you are an adult and then uh, migrate to another country, you might already be socialized in your origin country. So citizenship doesn't provide a lot of possibilities, people argue from this perspective, to be socialized in the destination country. Um, thirdly, if there is not just uh, statistical discrimination, uh, but what we call in the literature, taste-based discrimination of immigrants, right? On the basis of um, skin color, for example, or a name, then of course, citizenship will not uh, solve that. Right? So it is not a panacea for all the uh, problems that immigrants face. So it will not eradicate uh, marginalization of immigrants. Right? And finally, uh, from the Crown perspective, politicians argue that, well, we shouldn't give citizenship away too easily because it will demotivate uh, migrants from um, acquiring the uh, skills that are important to become part of society. Okay, now we get to the chicken and egg uh, question. And here the other question is, if we want to know if citizenship has a causal effect on integration, uh, how, do we in, how do we investigate this? Because we, we, we might also expect that the more integrated immigrants are more likely to become a citizen, right? So if a naturalized immigrant is doing better in the labor market, is that because citizenship helps a person in the labor market? Or is it because this person was already a certain qualities that may, may uh, make him uh, function well in the labor market and also more likely to become a citizen, right? So the causal errors um, of the um, errors of the, uh, the model are not exactly clear. The blue lines would be the, uh, the argument for the catalyst perspective, right? So if a migrant acquires citizenship, this might lead to more positive um, integration outcomes, but it may also be the other way around. Okay, so it's a complex uh, relation, but um, luckily there are different ways to deal with this. And there are two ways that I want to briefly introduce uh, to you. Um, one is the longitudinal approach and one is the quasi-experimental approach. And the longitudinal approach makes use of um, longitudinal data. So what we call panel data, where we can track migrants over time. That's what I do with my colleagues in the My Life Status Research Project, where we make use of administrative register data 
and track, for example, labor market outcomes of immigrants over time in one year and in the next year and in the next year. And we also track the legal status of an immigrant, right? So is he or she a citizen in a certain year? And so we, we can then compare the labor market outcomes before and after naturalization. Right? And that's one way to isolate, you could say, some of the characteristics that might drive both labor market participation and citizenship uh, acquisition, which are difficult to observe on the basis of survey or administrative data, right? what we call in the literature unobserved characteristics. So we used a model that is uh, developed by Bratsberg et al. So you can read more about that if you're interested. Now, the second approach to this uh, chicken and egg problem is to do an experimental approach. And you hear nowadays, you hear actually a lot about experiments when we talk about the Corona vaccine, right? So we want to develop a vaccine. And in order to know if it works, we give the vaccine to um, one uh, group of persons. But then if we want to really know if it works, of course, we need to give another group of persons a placebo, right? Something that uh, they might think is actually the vaccine, but it's not, it uh, doesn't have any effect, right? And then we, we see if actually the vaccine has a causal effect on them. Um, um, yeah, being protected against uh, the coronavirus. Now with citizenship, of course, we cannot experiment. We cannot say, well, let's give uh, one group of migrants citizenship and the other one, we, we uh, keep them um, out of citizenship um, for a couple of years extra and we allocate that randomly. But we cannot uh, do that, right? So, and that's of course in many social science uh, questions, uh, the case. So we have to work with what we uh, might call a natural experiment or quasi-experimental approaches, right? Where we cannot randomly allocate the treatment, but actually we can make use of a situation that is already out there, um, which is quasi-experimental. And um, researchers in Switzerland have uh, developed a very interesting uh, design. You can see the reference here, and you can read more about that um, online if you're interested in that. And the idea is that until um, yeah, some years ago, until 2003. So you might know in Switzerland, they do a lot with referendums and they don't only decide about political questions in referendums, but they also decided about who is to be a citizen. Right? So even earlier, they actually voted on the town square. Can this person be a citizen or not? But a little bit later, they developed a system where somebody has to apply, uh, submit a re uh, resume and then um, a committee had to look at um, uh, whether um, whether um, you would actually be um, um, granted citizenship or not, right? Uh, or actually a, a, a vote count. And in these so-called citizenship referendum, some people might receive just enough votes to become a citizen, so 51%, and then there would be Swiss citizen, whereas others received just too little votes, only 49% of the votes, and therefore they were not a Swiss uh, citizen. Right? And in this case, the allocation of Swiss citizenship is, you could say, almost uh, random. Right? It doesn't depend on the person, him or herself, and especially people around the cutoff, 49 versus 51, they might, we might assume that they are relatively comparable, and, and the people in the literature, and they also check for this. Right? So we can use those kind of um, quasi-experimental setups to, to um, find out a bit more about uh, whether citizenship matters. Uh, Melissa, sorry, I don't see any chats, but uh, do I still have maybe five minutes or so to talk? Okay, perfect. So let's talk about some of the findings, right? So once we apply these two different models, um, what do we actually find? And you see here an overview um, from Helgert et al. of the literature on the labor market premiums of citizenship acquisition. You see it's a bit mixed, but uh, what's actually important is that there are no negative signs. So we, ha we don't see any findings where at least in this overview where citizenship leads to um, worse uh, labor market outcomes. Um, I would say that is already an indication that the crown perspective is maybe a bit problematic in the sense that um, the assumption that once you uh, get citizenship, you might be demotivated to um, further progress in integrating in society. But of course, um, also if we do not find any significant effect, that would still be more in favor of the uh, crown perspective rather than the um, catalyst perspective. Now in the literature where we apply this longitudinal approach, we actually see relatively, um, and these countries, Denmark, Sweden, the Netherlands, we see relatively consistent uh, naturalization, naturalization premiums 
but we do find that it matters a bit uh, or it matters on the context so the country that we are talking about and also where an immigrant is from right so and we find that uh, citizenship in the labor market matters especially for more marginalized immigrants immigrants who tend to face more discrimination in the labor market right where perhaps uh, employers have bigger doubts about hiring a, uh, an immigrant and this is where citizenship might uh, give them a push in the labor market right so uh, in these studies that you see here we actually find evidence with regard to the labor market for the crown perspective and when we go to the swiss uh, context and you can see this later when you go to the youtube uh, clip you can pause it and uh, study the graphs a bit more uh, quietly um, but in the, um, the studies from switzerland they find more or less the same uh, as we find on the basis of these observational studies based on longitudinal data and they use this quasi experimental design so the green lines relate to the immigrants who were lucky enough just to become a citizen and the um, purple lines are the ones of the immigrants who were just uh, rejected and especially if you look at the graph in the lower bottom um, uh, corner uh, that you see here you see that there are long-term um, earnings um, advantages of um, winning swiss citizenship in uh, the uh, citizenship referenda and this amounts to over five thousand us dollars over the subsequent 15 years after acquiring uh, citizenship um, well, what we, um, what we see in the literature is that the context really matters. Uh, so it depends also on the conditions, right? And um, here we also see that it's not only about employers uh, taking decisions, but it's also about an immigrant uh, being motivated to acquire skills. And from this perspective, we, we expect that if an the longer an immigrant lives in a country, the less citizenship matters, right? Because if you live in a country relatively shortly, you can uh, you have a um, reasonable perspective on um, acquiring citizenship. Um, you are motivated to um, acquire citizenship and the skills of uh, finding your way around the country. For example, learning the language and and finding out um, what are the um, important ways of acquiring a job and maybe meeting friends, investing in a network, and that also pays off in the labor market. And that's what you see in this graph that there is indeed a citizenship premium in the labor market but it is much higher for immigrants who are naturalized after uh, for example four years have, of having lived in a country and much less for those who have already lived eight to ten years and that's actually what we also see in the swiss studies again based on the quasi experimental design when they look at long-term social integration so for example the plans to stay in switzerland the discrimination club membership or reading a newspaper that overall there were long-term social integration benefits of acquiring citizenship um, and this they find is especially the case if naturalization occurs earlier in the residency period rather than later okay um, so we get to the conclusion um, so when we talk about this relation between citizenship and immigrant integration first of all it's clear that this is politically controversial so politicians have different views but we as scholars, of course, want to make a contribution to these kind of debates and we try to investigate those questions empirically. And when we do that, we find that it's complex. So there are chicken and egg uh, problems, but actually there are different ways to deal with this. Right? So the using longitudinal data, tracking people over time or um, trying to find one of these uh, quasi experimental setups. So a net, doing a natural, making use of a natural experiment. Um, and when we do this, actually, I would say almost all of the literature um, on this topic finds that uh, citizenship does function as an incentive, so a catalyst of integration. And there is very little literature that finds that um, after having naturalized, immigrants uh, give up on integrating, they are happy, they sit back and they no longer um, uh, worry about acquiring skills that actually helps them of um, finding their way around the new uh, society. So this assumption that politicians who favor the crown perspective sometimes have that um, acquiring citizenship and making it uh, available too easily demotivates people from um, acquiring skills that are important for um, building up a new life in the destination context, we actually do not find any evidence uh, for this. What we do find is that 
maybe it's not so much about whether citizenship matters, but it is more about under which conditions does it matter to whom and how it matters, right? And this is where um, I will conclude that also, that's, uh, those are, of course, are important lessons to keep in mind when we talk about the current situation, right? Because citizenship matters not only because it, maybe you are slightly less discriminated as an immigrant, but it also matters because it gives you a certain prospect of uh, becoming a uh, full member of the society where you live. And in that way, you can build up your new uh, life in the destination country. And from that perspective, the pandemic, of course, um, may have a strong effect, right? The effect, right? We can only measure the effect um, in a couple of years and uh, rest assured that many uh, of my colleagues, of course, they're already thinking about how can we make use of this uh, pandemic, right? It's of course awful to live in, but from a scientist, uh, scientific perspective, it may be interesting because it gives us this quasi experimental setup, right? We are now in, an, in, um, in a very diff different situation than we were in um, October, 2019. So we can compare perhaps October, 2019 with October, 2020. Right? And when we do this, we would expect that immigrants who live in a destination country and who will, will, will live under much more insecurity. Right? So we hear about citizenship ceremonies that are um, suspended. Um, maybe the immigration office is closed or only available at very restrictive times. Um, maybe you happen to, to, be, um, to, um, to have gone uh, back to the country where you are from for a certain period and you want to come back to your destination country, but you cannot be repatriated because you are not a citizen. So immigrants face all of these um, questions. And um, that is also what was found in a recent study. And I'll conclude with that, that just came out in uh, the Netherlands on um, promising policies for integration on the labor market by uh, the Social Cultural Planning Bureau in the Netherlands, where they also uh, predict Right? So we have to see if it, if it will be like that, that the coronavirus crisis threatens to leave deep scars on the labor market with certain groups being hit particularly hard, including immigrant groups. Right? So how that will play out, we have to um, see. Um, but, it's some, but politicians who are currently in this situation, they can make use of the literature already. And the literature on citizenship, of course, gives already some... Um, tools to deal with this. And what's, what's important, that's for sure, that what, what we find is that, um, yeah, a, a reasonable trajectory towards legal uh, security through citizenship is something that will help immigrants actually find their way in the destination country. So if you want to read a bit more about some of the publications that we have, you can find them all in open access on the My Life Status uh, website. Um, Email me if you have uh, specific questions or ideas, but we first have, I think, the Q&A for some further questions. So thanks a lot for your attention. Yes, thank you so much, Martin. You brought us through a lot of information in a relatively short period of time. So thank you for that. Um, just actually to uh, um, answer a couple of questions that were from the chat already, um, we are recording this also right now. So after the lecture is finished, it will also be available online um, on the UNU Merit uh, on the UNU Merit YouTube channel. So don't worry, you can also go back through and watch things that you didn't get a chance to fully grasp the first time. So I'll start with a first question from Gabriela Stepkova. So I'm sorry, you guys, if I'm butchering your names. Um, she asks, why does the Netherlands have such a restrictive approach towards double citizenship or dual citizenship? Okay, thanks a lot, Melissa. Shall I answer straight away? That may be easier, right? Yes, um, I think that's easiest. Actually, that uh, brings me to the, I, I anticipated that uh, question. So I have a, exactly my next uh, slide here. And you see here uh, a table from a, um, a paper that we're currently uh, working on. And um, on that question um, on dual citizenship uh, conditions, maybe we, we can first look at the situation in the Netherlands. And you see here that we compare Denmark, the Netherlands and Sweden. And for dual citizenship, just look at the right hand side of the uh, graph. Um, and actually, so the first comment on this would be that, well, the Netherlands has a restrictive policy, but um, it is mixed, right? So we don't have the most restrictive policy that you could, um, that you could imagine. Um, actually, we had a, a very tolerant policy in the Netherlands until 1990, um, 
six middle of 1997 um, and then we changed the policy so, um, and now we are in a mixed um, policy right but so first of all let's clarify dual citizenship right so what does dual citizenship mean it means that a person might a person is a citizen has a legal relation with a state with two states right a citizen of two states that's what we mean with dual citizenship now from an immigration perspective if you want to become a Dutch citizen uh, and you want to naturalize in the Netherlands in the, and we see this in more countries so Denmark until recently and Sweden until uh, 2001 um, these countries they uh, apply what is called a renunciation requirement a difficult term so the requirement to renounce your former citizen citizenship right so if you want to become a citizen of the netherlands as an immigrant then in principle we ask you to give up your the citizenship of the country where you are from and indeed it's a fair question uh, why is the netherlands uh, doing that right um, um actually it's mixed because um, in the netherlands we do many things uh, mixed um right so you might think of um coffee shops so uh, drugs is illegal but you can still buy it in the coffee shop right so it is a bit of um, uh, let's say an ambiguous uh, we tend to have many of these kind of ambiguous policies because we see some of the uh, cons and also some of the pros and that's what we see also with dual citizenship so we are restrictive but we make exceptions right and um, but the best advice that i can have can give if you want to become a dutch citizen but uh, keep your former citizenship, then you have to find a, a person to marry with, right? Of course, it has to be a legitimate uh, marriage, right? So um, if you, if your, if your uh, partner happens to be a Dutch citizen, right? Then actually you don't have to give up your former citizenship, right? And that's actually applies to a big group of uh, people. So if you fall in that category, actually you don't have to give up your other citizenship. Um, but also if you are, for example, from Morocco, where the Moroccan authorities don't allow you to give up your citizenship, then the Netherlands doesn't expect you to give it up because you cannot, right? So again, an exception. Um, okay, Gabriela, to answer your question, so why is the Netherlands so restrictive? The answer is very uh, simple. It's uh, politics, right? And we see, you see here in the graph that actually the legal policies, they change and, and that reflects uh, partly the um, political dynamics, right? So the current government, actually um, we have a, um, uh, of course, a um, center-right uh, government. They actually um, have in their uh, government uh, plans to liberalize dual citizenship, but in the end, they are deciding not to do it because it seems to be too politically controversial right so um yeah they were and as long as um, the uh, the parties who are against this so again they the politicians who are against dual citizenship they feel that this is an obstacle towards integration in the destination context so they feel that immigrants can never be a fully integrated person citizen in the netherlands if they keep their uh, citizenship of the origin country um, from the literature, we know that this is actually, it really doesn't have to be like that, right? So the transnationalism literature gives us um, a lot of evidence that migrants are perfectly capable of um, living in two um, or living in one country and maintaining connections with the country where they're from. Um, and actually a natural, so we know that the dual citizenship um, ban, you could say in the Netherlands makes uh, fewer immigrants naturalize and I think that this actually will have a negative effect on integration right because you block the the, the yeah the citizenship trajectory of a, a group of people for whom giving up citizenship would be very costly financially or emotionally and so from that perspective um, yeah I think it will actually it actually has a um, country effects but um, politicians have different views right and this reflects the policies that we have. Thank you, Martin. So Anna Marina asks, could colonial ties of the country also affect the choices of strategic citizenship? So for example, Brazilians or Angolans trying to get Portuguese citizenship, has there perhaps been research on this? Yes, um, it's a very good question. So uh, two very good questions. So colonial ties, of course, are extremely important, I think, in citizenship studies. Um, 
you could say in general, history is extremely important. Right? So when we talk about um, citizenship regimes, so the, yeah, the policies that are in place and that the, on who is to be a citizen and who not, um, actually they are very, what we call in the, um, in the political science literature, they are very path dependent, right? So first of all, the citizenship policies often reflect a certain history. So we, we, uh, we see that, uh, for example, certain former, former colonial powers like Portugal or the Netherlands or the UK, they might be characterized by certain types of uh, policies because they have already some um, previous immigration experience. Um, um, and um, yeah, I think you're, um, you're completely right that when you um, uh, talk about strategic citizenship, I think um, it's not only about former migration uh, movements, so uh, diasporas from the 19th century or the first half of the 20th century, um, but also about colonial ties. First of all, because in some former colonial countries, um, being from a former colonial um, uh, territory might give you facilitated, facilitated access to, um, to the citizenship of the destination country, but it might also indirectly benefit you because you are able to speak the language. Um, and actually between Brazil and Portugal, for example, um, there is a facilitated, um, um, not so much a facilitated citizenship regime, but there is a facilitated immigration regime, right? So it is more easy for somebody from Brazil to travel to uh, Portugal. And once that person is in Portugal, right? so in Portugal, you need to speak Portuguese in order to, do, to become uh, a Portuguese citizen. The test is not um, as uh, strict as it is in uh, Denmark to become a Danish citizen, for example, but still you need to speak Portuguese. And that's of course um, easy to do for Brazilians who speak uh, Portuguese. So in that perspective, it is easier to travel to uh, that country. And it is also, once you are there, it is also easier to um, acquire the citizenship. And people might also be more inclined to travel to that country because there are already large uh, communities um, of their, yeah, former co-patriots, right? So there's a large Brazilian community in Portugal, which might help you to uh, build up your life in Portugal because it provides a certain network. So, um, and, and yeah, the, the work by um, Yossi Harpas on strategic citizenship, it's in a book which is called Citizenship 2.0. Um, yeah, talks about uh, these kind of uh, ties um, yeah, historical uh, ties that uh, play an important part in this kind of strategic citizenship. Thank you for that. So, of course, plenty more citizenship questions here. So, um, Manezuraman Al Masood asks um, We see that some rich country, in some rich countries, people buy their citizenship. Um, in uh, different developed countries. So he's asking what kind of citizenship is this when someone can quote unquote buy their citizenship? Okay, well, another excellent uh, question. So they're all excellent. And that's a topic that is extremely, um, an extremely hot potato as we uh, say, right? So this is called citizenship for sale um, or sometimes we call this investor citizenship. So if you um, look over my uh, left shoulder, you see here the logo of um, Global CIT. So that's the Global Citizenship Observatory. And that's um, uh, yeah, a website that I run together with colleagues uh, here um, in Florence, but also with the whole network in Europe and the rest of the world, uh, where we collect information on citizenship policies around the world. And, um, you also find their um, um, information on these uh, investor citizenship policies. And actually two days ago, I think, or maybe the end of last week, the European Commission of the European Union, they instituted what is called a technical term, an infringement procedure. So they started a procedure against um, um, Malta and Cyprus, if I'm, uh, if I'm um, correct, um, which are two uh, member states of the European Union that have these um, uh, investor citizenship uh, policies, the citizenship for sale policies. And that's again, very much related to strategic citizenship, right? So you would have people um, 
actually maybe not so so uh, yeah you have uh, people and in, in the case of malta and cyprus i think there are a lot of people from uh, russia and china for example who acquire um, maltese uh, citizenship um, and so they um, for example they uh, they they uh, buy this or they buy a house and that gives them uh, access to citizenship so the um, acquisition of citizenship is not is not related to um, residents right and that's what when we talk about naturalization when i talked about naturalization so far i talked about what we might call residence based naturalization this is sometimes also called ordinary naturalization but of course there are many ways in which you can become a citizen of a country right again i could give a separate lecture on this i talked already a bit about how to get it at birth there are different ways of getting citizenship at birth by being born in a country by descent then you can get this by naturalization. Um, but indeed, um, you might also acquire the uh, citizenship through special ties. Um, sometimes uh, countries uh, grant citizenship to people who have uh, specific qualities like a sportsman, right? Uh, so in the Netherlands, for example, people who play badminton have um, acquired citizenship because they have special qualities. They're very good at badminton. and. Um, by um, granting them Dutch citizenship, they can compete for the Netherlands in the Olympics, right? It's not citizenship for sale, but sports uh, citizenship. But then there are also countries that say, well, um, we are actually um, interested in um, additional economic revenues. And that's why these often tend to be, um, actually, we're doing a project on this. So uh, at the moment, it's not exactly uh, clear, but we find a lot of examples of small island countries that tend to have these uh, citizenship for sale regimes right i mentioned already uh, malta and cyprus but there are also many in the caribbean for example and also some in polynesia right? but then there are also other larger countries that that uh, that are not islands uh, that that have these but many many of these countries they tend to be smaller um yeah smaller or countries or even islands and um, that's because maybe they don't have so much um, possibilities to um, industrialize right so they are looking for creative ways to um, to generate uh, additional economic revenue and um, sit, uh, citizenship for sale might selling your citizenship might be one way of uh, generating additional revenue now there are many um, controversies associated with this um, does it actually generate revenue and if it generates revenue uh, for whom does it generate revenue, right? Does it generate revenue for the country or for corrupt politicians? Um, that's, uh, I think, the main basis for the, the European Commission to be concerned about this, right? So it does, does do these uh, practices um, encourage corruption? But the Commission also is concerned about um, what is called uh, genuine links, right? So if you, um, Right. If you if you give citizenship, um, if you if you make citizenship uh, available um, by buying it, so for purchase, then maybe it doesn't really reflect a um, a link between a person and a country, right? And this concept of genuine link, so which I briefly mentioned, is it's a complicated term from the literature that the Commission uh, used. And we're going to post a blog post on the Global Cit, I think, tomorrow on this. So if you're interested, um, you should certainly. Um, uh, look at this but um yeah um, whether this means the same will be um uh, will depend right so for an individual it might be uh, it's probably reflects again strategic citizenship right so it is a specific form of strategic citizenship and it provides uh, mobility rights for the people who uh, purchase uh, citizenship through these kind of uh, schemes um i see melissa already ready to ask more questions so i will stop here <laughs> Yes, I am. There are more questions come flooding in now. So um, Yanis Derakis asks, um, is the world heading toward a more global citizenship regime or towards more restrictive citizenship policies? Okay. Uh, well, yeah, of course, I could uh, expect that there are complicated questions, right, with a complicated topic such as uh, citizenship. So um, maybe we have to ask a very good question, Yanis. So, um, Maybe we have to take a step back and um, think about how citizenship is regulated, right? And um, citizenship actually is regulated at the moment um, through um, mostly through national um, states, right? So through countries. And so from this perspective, um, it's actually countries who decide um, 
who is to be a citizen, right? And so, um, and in some ideal uh, scenario from the 19th century, everybody would be a citizen of one country only, but nowadays uh, dual citizenship has proliferated. Many uh, countries accept this. They recognize this as a um, demographic uh, fact that um, people uh, move between two countries. Um, you have mixed, uh, mixed citizenship marriages, then the children will have the citizenship of both the parents and then you have dual citizens. So it is no longer very meaningful to uh, restrict this. Um, so um, yeah, we see, so that actually uh, means that we, um, even though citizenship is nationally organized, we do see some trends that are, let's say international, right? So what the, there is what we call in the literature diffusion between countries. Right? So we do see certain global trends. Um, in Europe, you also see some trends and you see it reflected here in the, um, on the left-hand side, for example, where since the last um, 15, 20 years, countries have started, uh, many countries have started to institute um, additional requirements for uh, citizenship. So on the one hand, they have become, generally speaking, more liberal with regard to dual citizenship. Even Denmark, you see here at the top, has a liberalized citizenship. So we are now in the green uh, phase after 2015. Um, but Denmark also has quite restrictive um, language and civic integration requirements. That means that if you want to, and residence requirements. So if you want to become Danish, you have to live there for nine years. You have to speak Danish. I think now it's at the level of B1 and you have to do a knowledge uh, test about what it means to live in Denmark. And as you might have heard on the news, you have to uh, shake hands at the citizenship ceremony. Right? So that's a particular element of the Danish um, requirements. In the Netherlands, you also have to do a civic and language test, but it's actually more moderate, right? So um, uh, you have to invest in this, um, but then it seems that the civic test is not too difficult, but um, and the language test, you have to uh, speak and read Dutch at uh, level A2 and write, right? Well, Melissa can say if that's difficult or not. Generally speaking, people say it's not too, um, not too difficult, but of course, um, maybe I show one slide that, um, in the, the paper that we're doing, we see that's actually um, more difficult for some people than for others, right? Um, and of course, especially if you are highly educated, uh, if you're a highly educated immigrant, and I expect that many of uh, you are listening in will be, um, yeah, will be uh, well educated. And then for, for if you are highly educated, then it will not be um, too difficult to acquire Dutch at the level A2, right? Danish B1 or even B2 is a different story. That's actually still quite uh, complicated. And that's what you see, we also find this. Um, but in the Netherlands, we find that these kind of requirements uh, that were instituted in the Netherlands in 2003 affect especially less educated migrants, right? So, um, um, and this is uh, something that we see in other countries as well. So there is a restrictive uh, trend, but um, um, yeah, it's a bit of a mixed uh, bag. So the dual citizenship liberalization makes it more accessible, but the um, um, institution of language and uh, civic integration requirements is a bit more restrictive, but you see here that Sweden until now, you can become Swede after living there for five years and you don't have to do any test. They are currently discussing this in uh, Sweden, so that might uh, change. Um, well, whether there will be a global regime is, uh, of course, very unlikely because uh, citizenship is tied in with national sovereignty. Um, so that's something that uh, states uh, regulate and, and see as essential part of their uh, sovereignty. Um, we do see that there are forms of regional citizenship. So in the European Union, if you are a citizen of a member state, you are also a citizen of the European Union. And that means that actually also the European Union has some uh, competence in, um, in, uh, in this area, right? Very limited, but it does have some uh, competence. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that there are also international uh, law treaties, especially with regard to statelessness. So even though there's no global citizenship regime, there are elements of this uh, global citizenship regime um, that um, constrain, you could say, national sovereignty. And you should think as especially about um, statelessness, right? So um, there are uh, treaties that are um, in which the states have um, 
uh, agreed with each other to prevent uh, statelessness, right? Because in the current world, if you are not a citizen of any state, then of course your global mobility rights are extremely restricted, right? And so in the current state or uh, organized system, being a citizen of at least one state is an essential element. And that's why states have said, well, um, we, um, we collaborate with each other and ensure that um, if you, for example, found links, right? Or if somebody is born and the mother cannot take care of the child and um, abandons the child, then how do we know if the mother or the father was a citizen, right? And then states, uh, generally speaking, uh, agree that the, this, this child should then be uh, considered to be a citizen of the country where it was found. So in the case of foundlings, for example, um, citizenship is attributed. So this is part of a global, you could say, protection regime against statelessness. And the same if you are a refugee, right? If you flee from a country, um, countries also commit to providing facilitated naturalization. That's a very ambiguous uh, commitment. Um, but with regard to statelessness, they also commit to um, saying, well, uh, if somebody um, is from a country that no longer exists, right, um, we should work towards um, making um, citizenship available. So it's not only about uh, refugee status, but also the follow up step um, is important. And yeah, I think the final thing I would say there is that the commitments of states to those uh, global norms are very ambiguous and uh, the extent to which states live up to that are again very much determined by national politics so there are global norms but the you could say the implementation of the norms are still very um, dependent contingent you could say on um, on national uh, on national politics and national national legal orders so i just want to follow up there then um actually on the on the handshake point because um, Megan Burma actually asks, to what extent do you believe that the naturalization process will become stricter or easier when the pandemic is over? For instance, um, a German naturalization was refused due to the refusal to shake hands. Oh yes, yeah, something that you're probably uh, very much aware of. So yeah, bringing that handshaking in the naturalization process back into the discussion. Yeah, well, that's a very good uh, point. And uh, also in Denmark, um, the, uh, the naturalization uh, ceremonies actually were suspended um, because uh, people could not shake hands. So I think that's completely the wrong uh, approach. First of all, handshakes, I don't think should be a mandatory element of um, acquiring citizenship in liberal democracies where we should allow citizens some uh, room in their private life to um, um, act as they please. So I don't see this as an essential element of um, being a citizen in a, um, in a liberal or democratic uh, context. Again, politicians will have different uh, views of this. Um, so in Denmark, they were suspended. And indeed, the German case is interesting that I uh, also um, noticed this. What was interesting that um, right, so in Germany, um, some years ago already, um, uh, I think a gentleman uh, refused to uh, shake hands uh, with the uh, civil servant at the naturalization ceremony. Um, and I'm not sure how um, obligatory the handshake is, but at least this was seen as a um, failure to commit to, um, to German um, liberal norms, uh, German equality norms in particular, right? Because the uh, civil servant was a, um, a woman and um, the, I think the, the, yeah, the immigrant a doctor, I think, um, refused uh, to uh, shake hands of the female civil servant. This was seen as a sign of um, yeah, lack of respect for equality, I think, equality norms, and therefore violating norms in a, in a liberal democratic context. What that in itself, I think, is extremely controversial. What was remarkable was that the judge said that indeed handshakes are an essential element of German culture and even made a specific um, prediction on the pandemic that even though in the current situation, right, because this was from some year, the case was from, from some years ago, but the uh, judgment was from a couple of weeks ago, the uh, judge said during the uh, pandemic, he said, well, um, even though we cannot shake hands now, it is so an essential element of German culture that I expect that this will stay this way. Well, we can talk about uh, predictions, but actually I'm not sure if we are still um, if we still know how to uh, shake hands after uh, being in the pandemic for eight or nine uh, months. So um, 
yeah, I'm not exactly sure, Megan, um, whether this will um, whether this will persist. But I, I do think that uh, these kind of I would say a bit odd uh, norms, like um, mandatory handshakes, I think they yeah they become um, they were already highly questionable before, and I think they become more questionable in the pandemic, right? Because of the pandemic, when we see that, well, of course, we are forced to live uh, to live our lives in different ways, and that makes us even reflect more. On, um, on these kind of norms. But yeah, the, on the other hand, uh, you see that uh, the judge in Germany said, well, this is still so important element of German culture that um, I expect this uh, to come back and uh, may, to be maintained even after the pandemic. So yeah, it's difficult to do, um, to do a prediction, to make predictions, but um, some, yeah, some things of course uh, will change, but uh, maybe um, our memories are also short term and we will just go back to normal. And yeah, in some, in some elements we, of course, going back to normal, we all want to go back to normal, but in this particular example, I don't think going back to normal is necessarily good. So I'll just wrap up with one last question then that is already related to um, a few of the other questions. So um, in, the, in probably your previous slide to this, how is tolerant or restrictive defined when looking at citizenship policies? And how is this related to selective migration policies? So for instance, selecting the highly skilled migrants or, or is it? Yeah, so good question. So restrictive, we generally look at this from the perspective of individual freedom, um, right? So liberal or restrictive. So um, yeah, the more uh, requirements that states impose on individuals, um, the more restrictive the policy, right? So in Sweden, right, I call the, I, I, uh, I, I do this here, tolerant. It's tolerant from a dual citizenship perspective in the sense that Sweden already since 2001 fully tolerates the autonomy of individuals to make a choice, right? Whether they want to be a citizen and of Sweden and of the country where they are from, or whether they want to give up their citizenship of the country where they are from. Um, it's up to uh, individuals to, um, to make that choice. And so, yeah, tolerant or liberal, we, we typically use for uh, regimes that give a lot of um, freedom to individuals to make these kind of choices, whereas the restrictive regimes impose uh, choice on individuals, right? Whether to, uh, not only um, whether you want or can have two citizenships, uh, whether you want or can uh, learn the language, but also whether you, uh, yeah, whether you should um, accept um, certain norms that we find um, uh, self-evident in uh, liberal democratic Western uh, context that may be uh, more uh, uh, nuanced in other contexts, right? And so it's about imposing uh, norms also on, on others and whether you're liberal or uh, restrictive. Um, well, citizenship is, uh, so the second part of the question, whether how citizenship regimes interact with migration regimes, I think they are, yeah, they are both, um, similar and different, right? So you could say that um, they are two, they are both elements, they're both examples of um, border policies, right? And you could argue that uh, migration regimes, they, um, uh, immigration regimes, they uh, act as external border controls and citizenship uh, acts as internal border controls. So first you have to get through the territorial border into a country. Um, once you are in the country, you have to uh, cross the border to um, the membership, to, to a citizenship, through the citizenship policy. Um, and in that sense, you see that, um, yeah, the same kind of discussions uh, come back on both immigration and citizenship policy. So in the Netherlands, we also have um, yeah, integration requirements. So we have the integration abroad exam, right? So for uh, even for come, before you come to the Netherlands, you already knew, need to, demonstrate that you know something about language and integration uh, and knowledge of Dutch uh, society. Um, so they are in that sense quite um, similar. Yeah, the distinction between internal and external borders is also a bit misleading because exactly what we discussed earlier in the discussion when we talked about strategic citizenship, actually citizenship can act as a migration instrument, right? So even if you are not residing in the country, you might be able to acquire citizenship by descent, ancestry, 
or perhaps uh, through uh, economic means just by buying it. So you don't have to reside in uh, usually in the country that offers citizenship for sale. And in that sense, citizenship can also be a migration instrument. So um, yeah, the distinction between immigration and citizenship regimes in that sense is, is a bit more complicated than just internal and external borders. Well, thank you, Martin, for answering all of those quite difficult questions, but I'm sure you could also give a lecture almost on, uh, on each of them. Um, so we really appreciate you being with us today. For those of you who are, who are interested in more of, of Martin's work on citizenship, um, please check out the My Life Status Project. All the information is also here on the screen. Um, you can also follow um, Martin on Twitter. Um, where he's also often giving lots of interesting information about citizenship issues. Um, just a reminder that this lecture has been recorded and will be available for everyone also online on the UNU Merit YouTube channel, so it will be freely available for you. And a reminder about our next lecture, our next um, uh, Maastricht Migration Lecture Series online that will take place November 25th. Um, again, at the same time, so uh, seven o'clock Dutch time in the evening. And there we'll be looking specifically at labor market integration of, uh, of immigrants. So I hope to see you all then. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being so engaged and asking so many questions, so many good questions. And I hope to see you all next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.